welcome and uh, thank you for being with us in person for The Art of Possible, um, The Future of Fashion, The Tech Edit. So we are absolutely delighted and excited to be back in person after two and a half long years. Um, but thanks to all of you who have continued to take part in our online edition of The Art of Possible. So, Glasgow has one of the most diverse innovation economies and our, our key growth sectors from the creative industries to healthcare to clean tech are increasingly diffusing, emerging and enabling tech in really clever ways, from 3D printing and AI to photonics and robotics to innovate groundbreaking products, processes and services. So we established The Art of Possible about six years ago with the intention of inspiring and supporting greater tech adoption and collaboration across disciplines and sectors to spark creative and impactful innovation with the ultimate aim of supporting startups and SMEs in relation to business resilience and growth. But The Art of Possible fundamentally is about making more visible our sort of local um, and national innovation that's kind of happening within business and to really create uh, an informal and friendly space uh, where the innovation ready and the innovation curious could hear from leaders from the worlds of business, academia and more and critically leaders from a range of sectors, leaders who are bold, who are creative, who are innovative and who are collaborative. Leaders that are committed to the nurturing of cultures of innovation that combine purposeful leadership with the right tech solutions for people, planet, and the bottom line. So Art of Possible is brought to you today by Glasgow City of Science and Innovation uh, with support from our partners, Innovate UK, KTN, Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise, and Glasgow City Council. And we're an ongoing sort of build up or feeder series for the Can Do Innovation Summit, which is the National Innovation Summit, um, which we also curate. Um, and the summit, um, at, you can, you can or handle, is it there? Yes, at Can Do Summit, um, that serves as a focal point for business innovation in Scotland, and it was last held in February this year. But today, we will hear from leading experts in fashion, textiles, and jewellery making that blend traditional skills with transformative new tech whilst exploring different materials and constructs to push the boundaries of design that is both cutting edge and sustainable without compromising quality or craftsmanship. So no matter what your sector or your business, um, we just hope that by the end of the session that you will be inspired and inspired to act based on what you hear and who you connect with. So, a little bit of uh, housekeeping before I hand you over to our chair, Abby. Um, so the toilets are just on the right of the lifts, out to the right. Um, there isn't a fire alarm planned. Um, if a fire alarm or emergency situation arises, you'll hear a siren and a voice, and we'll leave the rooms by the nearest uh, exit to you. Please just use the stairs, not lifts or escalators. Um, there's also, if you need it, refuge areas, if you can't get down the stairs, at the fire escapes on floors one and this floor, floor five. The Wi-Fi, uh, there's no password, is SCAS Wi-Fi. Um, and oh, I should also say the assembly, the muster point is just outside at the Scottish Power substation on uh, Mitchell Street, just near the NCP car park. So we're going to record today's um, session, so just the panel session um, and the Q&A, which will be shared after the event um, on CanDoInnovation.scot website um, and on our social media channels. So if you don't want to appear uh, in any photos or filming, just let me know or Laura at the back there or Stephen, who you met um, as, you were, as you were coming in, and we'll remove you from um, any filming pics, etc. So feel free to connect with us online too, share your thoughts, reflections using the hashtag, hashtag Art of Possible, and follow us at Can Do Summit and also at City of Science. Um, the format today will be a short intro, um, a, a talk from each of our speakers, follow, followed by a moderated discussion um, before the chair opens up to the floor for you to ask questions. And we've already re received a lot of questions, so thanks for those from the audience when you registered. Um, we might not get through all of those, um, but your chair will select some of those um, to shape our discussions. And of course, you can, you can ask uh, more questions in our Q&A. So 
Central to Art of Possible is the diversity of our contributors and our attendees, and today's event is no exception. We've got everyone from creatives, scientists and technologists in the room to innovation support practitioners, sustainability leads and policy makers. So a great mix of people, I think, to spark some fresh ideas and thoughts and key discussion points throughout the session. And so it's my absolute pleasure uh, to hand over to our chair, uh, Abby. So um, Abby uh, leads the Design Innovation Network, um, working across all sectors um, and technology areas. She creates connections to help uh, innovators leverage good design practice to deliver positive change. And she's got deep expertise in design, manufacturing, innovation and engineering management. Um, and she previously led KTN's Navigating to Design to Manufacture Journey programme. So over to Abby. Abby, thanks for being here. Thanks, Susie. Um, yeah, it's really uh, it's so good to be here. What a, what a privilege to be part of such a great event and um, good event programme as well. And it's so nice to be back in person out of our pyjamas and our slippers and actually face to face. It's nice to see people chatting in person and sitting around tables together. Um, yeah, really refreshing. And what a great topic to be discussing the future of fashion and with that focus on technology, two areas that are really exciting coming together. And I think fashion is something that's so integral to, to our sense of identity, to um, our expression and to, to our well-being really. It is, it's a source of joy and creativity and yet we, we live in this world where the narrative around fashion is often, often quite negative about the damage it can do, about workers being treated unethically, about the planet, about landfill resources, water, transportation, all the waste. There's, there's some serious stuff around, around this topic. But I think what's so impressive about our panel today, and I think about, about Scottish fashion and about UK fashion in general, is a real overarching focus on quality and on design and on ethics. I think that really comes across strongly um, from the UK in this area. So high value, luxury, heritage, ethics, thoughtfulness, and good design are all terms that are really synonymous with, with this area. And I think for me, I, I work across sectors, different technology areas, but I think what fashion has to offer in terms of how they, they approach design, how they approach product development, there's lots of other sectors and technology areas can learn from this. So I'm really looking forward today to learning from our panel and from the discussions we have, from the contributions that come, come from the room as well. I think there's, there's loads of good chat that we, that we can have. So over the past few years, it's been quite noticeable that the, the role of technology in supporting production um, and sustainable fashion, and it's been a big, a big focus for UK research and innovation policy. So at Innovate UK KTN, we've worked on, on several reports in this area, looking at the opportunities, the barriers and the challenges. Um, there's one, one recently we worked on with the RCA and the Made Smarter Innovation Programme on reshoring fashion that might be of interest to you. And I think the conclusions that are drawn are, are definitely that technology has a big role to play in improving productivity and helping us realise designs um, but this is an area that's, that's ripe for innovation. It needs new thinking and fresh ideas. So beyond this focus on quality and ethics and doing things really well, the other thing that, that's really interesting about our panel is how they've, they've used technology, not, not just as something to produce their products, but they've used it in ways, uh, their understanding of technology to really inspire the creative process. Um, and that understanding of technology, the way they've approached it, has kind of unleashed what they've got to offer in really new and interesting ways. That's what I find most inspiring and exciting. And it's what I'm really looking forward to hearing about. So without further ado, um, we'll move on to our panel. So our first panelist turned to jewellery design. So originally uh, metal work, and this was after a degree in aerospace engineering. So I think you'll agree, I'm pretty sure, that the beauty of maths perhaps from this engineering background, comes across in her award-winning work. So Lynn has an, an MA from the Royal College of Art, which is the world's foremost number one design school, and a PhD from the Open University. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into Lynn's current work. It speaks for herself, and she's, she's brought some um, with her today. 
Uh, I'll leave that to Lynn. But everyone, please give a big hand for Dr. Lynn McLachlan. Hi, everyone, and thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Lynn McLachlan, and I'm a designer, maker, and researcher. Um, and as you've already heard, uh, after a brief background in engineering, I returned to education and studied Julian Metalwork, first at Duncan of Johnson, Dundee, and then at the Royal College of Art in London. After that, I did a PhD um, in design theory, which focuses on how um, designers use, designer makers use tools and technology and how they can adopt these and manipulate these um, to stimulate creativity in their practice. Um, which kind of um, was based off how I work myself. Um, but since then, I've more or less predominantly been running my own business as a designer maker. I produce jewellery uh, and some other objects, um, ranging from accessible jewellery pieces to more art jewellery pieces that are collector's items. These are sold online in galleries and boutiques and some museum shops. So that's just um, some of my pieces that are more art pieces. These are bangles. Um, so I have a studio. Um, I work in Glasgow and I'm based just at the Brigitte um, nearby. And I'm just going to skip to this. So that just gives you Another image of some of my more accessible pieces that I make are obviously very bright and sculptural, um, supposed to bring visual delight and, um, to the wearer and the viewer. So to talk about, uh, obviously the theme today is kind of innovation, probably the most innovative part of my business that I work in at the moment was the adoption of a certain kind of material. Um, it's laser-centered nylon. Um, I've also call it 3D printed nylon um, to make it more accessible for people to understand. Um, I've experimented with previously quite a few different 3D printing processes and I still do experiment and use other ones. But when I discovered this particular process um, just a couple of years after my master's, um, it was a very sort of exciting discovery at the time because it was a lot, one of the initial things was it was a lot cheaper to access and print on a jewellery scale than anything I'd had to access to before. And this just gave me the chance to suddenly prototype and experiment so rapidly um, without the worry of what everything was going to cost, which really was the first spark of kind of freedom of um, using this. But as I went on, I realised it is a bit of a wonder material. Um, there's very few restrictions on the geometry, um, geometries you can print with this technique. Um, it's also very durable, strong, it's very light, um, it's washable, it's uh, skin safe. Um, so it's just really good for making jewellery with a lot of impact. Um, and the other part that I brought um, to it was that it comes out of the machine white, as you can see here, and then I hand dye it. Um, in my studio in Glasgow, every piece is hand dyed by me. Um, it's because it's nylon, you can dye it with fabric dyes. And I think this kind of hybridization of the te technology and um, my kind of tech skills with these more hand skills and traditional skills that I'd also learned um, in my um, art degree, bringing the craft sensibilities hopefully creates sort of enduring objects um, that can be enjoyed for a long time. Um, so I think one of the other themes today is to talk about collaboration and support within innovation. Um, my path has been very much as a designer maker working on my own, um, which means that through my career I've had support rather than business and innovation grants and things like that. I've had support from bodies like Craft Scotland, other small pots of money that help makers, independent designers um, exhibit, make and exhibit work. Local Heroes is another one. Um, this particular work, um, large-scale work, uh, was funded by the Inches Car Trust, um, a trust that supports makers across Scotland to do more ambitious work. So these work, 
projects are obviously very exciting to do and fun to do, but this is kind of how my research and development has worked in a way through this kind of support so far. Um, for instance, these pieces were some of the first pieces I really experimented with extra parts and gradients and things, and all that drip has dripped into my more commercial range of pieces as my more bread and butter pieces for my business. Um, but I'd still love to maybe collaborate now beyond this as I'm looking to be a bit more business businessy um, if I can start to collaborate with people more in the design and innovation um, sphere. So just to talk about what my work focuses on in the moment in a more artistic way, um, I've experimented with a lot of different possibilities and properties of this material as I've got to understand it and uh, build expertise around using it and at the moment one of my kind of main interests is exploring the flexibility in my pieces and um, so certain geometries there's a slight flexibility to the material and I've brought along some samples so feel free to come and um, have a look at them at the end because the feel and look of them well the feel of them is quite different from what people expect sometimes but anyway the certain geometries give you a real full flexibility and kind of draping effect which again is great they almost become like garments um, they drape on the body and are very comfortable to wear and I think there's still a lot to be explored um, in that side of things um, yeah and in terms of going forward with my kind of developing I guess more of a brand now um, and um, what I want to do is kind of elevate my pieces more into luxury pieces and bring it maybe more into a luxury market and one of the ways I've always made precious metal work alongside this work um, a lot of which I make with a different 3D printing process I haven't always combined them um, a lot up to this point so I'm starting now to look at combining them and hopefully elevate the pieces into kind of a fine jewellery context um, uh, that is one I am sort of be build, building a brand sort of sustainably for the long run but also in terms of the environmental impact of what I do I want to make sure my pieces are consumed very consciously they can last, last a lifetime if they're looked after properly and um, that's also one of the big factors in where I'm kind of driving to now I think that's everything for now that I can fit in Thanks so much, Lynn. I think, uh, yeah, it's really beautiful and distinctive. Um, really lovely. Thanks for sharing that with us. And if you get a chance, I'd go and have a feel, because they do definitely feel like you can feel the quality in them. It's diff I thought they'd be kind of rubbery and soft, but they're not. They're really, like, they feel really nice. Um, so, yeah, our second panellist, our second panellist runs a luxury, eco-based fashion label, Rothio. Hopefully I'm saying that properly. Um, He's another engineer, so yeah, go, go the engineers. An instrument engineer originally with a career originating in oil and gas. He turned to art and fashion, experimenting with fashion, wood sculpture, and modern design techniques before launching his brand in 2006. So very, very excited about this speaker. Uh, give, let's give a big hand to Hamish Menzies. Okay, so uh, my name's Hamish Mingus. I'm the founder and creative director of a brand called Rothio, or Rothio or Rocio, however you want to call it. Um, yep, yeah, as Abby said, we launched the brand 2006, a small collection in London. Before before I go down that path, um, basically do a little bit of backstory. As Abby said, I started off qualified, educated, uh, early 20s, instrument engineer. Went up to Aberdeen um, and became and, and ended up getting into the oil and gas sector. Worked my way up and culminated uh, with BP uh, Amoco and um, worked there almost 14 years and just got a little bit bored and looking for fresher challenges. Always been in my, in my spare time. I was always into the arts and uh, dramatic arts, fine arts. So when it was Onshore, that's what I was going to do, go to theatre and all these things and galleries and museums. 
And um, <clears throat> what BP Amoco do from time to time is offer sabbaticals, so I took the opportunity to travel one year, and um, I never went back, never went back to BP. Well, I did, I resigned, but um, on that year, um, I, I, I found myself um, in Southeast Asia, and um, I came across this group of really talented um, wood sculptures. So, of course, loving the arts, uh, I sat with this, this group for a few days, and um, what, I, what, what, what struck me was um, how basic everything that they were using, coming from a high-tech industry, the oil and gas, I thought to myself uh, one night, I was thinking, if I could give them some tech designs, some drawings, some contemporary materials, in, in, in a kind of creative direction, I wonder, I wonder what they could produce. So that was the whole premise behind it. Came back to Scotland, um, and um, I kind of took that, um, that, that, that premise, and, um, and, I, and, and, and we went into development. And the whole idea behind Rocio was what I love, which is art, as opposed to utility. And I wanted to create something that, um, with the number of bags, so, so I wanted to create something that was aesthetically pleasing, that people could look at and admire. I really didn't, and, and so, I get ahead of myself, but so, so, so at the time, back in 2006, well, handbags and, and, and clutches and audiers were all the rage, so it kind of figured, well, they're in vogue. Let's try and take this, this design, this element of traditional wood sculpturing with contemporary materials, pan tours and so on and so forth, and nice hardware, contemporary materials from Italy and so on, merge the two together and create something aesthetically very pleasing. Oh, sorry. Do I have to go back again? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, I'll just repeat. So, basically, I came back to Scotland uh, where the premise was, let's try and marry... Um, these old traditional sculpting techniques with contemporary materials, with, with hardware, with, 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 for example, textiles from Italy and so on and so forth. Bring them all together and create something that aesthetically was very pleasing. More art. So this is what we, that, that, that was the premise behind developing the first collection in 2006. So, so this, is just a, this is just to give you an example of, of our workshop. We, start off, we started off with solid woods. Um, very, very briefly, we take it, one handbag is two pieces of wood, uh, solid acacia, sustainable, fast-growing species. We take it, we boil it, kill all the bad guys, put it in a kiln for a couple of days, dry it, and then we dechar it. We'd carve, cut, shape, and we had templates. And so, as you can imagine, um, we were, cons we were consuming, but it was a long process, design process that I I'd created over 19 stages that ultimately would lead to an object that people would like to look at. It, and it had the natural beauty of the grain of the wood and so on and so forth. So, so again, we, we, with this we would... Um, Every season we'd have seasonality, so for, this is one of our signature designs called the Coco, it's a handbag, like I say, made out of acacia wood, and we would put this in seasonal pantones. Um, we would have our core collection, but um, every season when we presented where it was Paris or London, we would show the buyers a seasonality. <clears throat> so... This is a typical display of our products, um, again, all out of wood. Um, the, the, basically, the, the premise behind Rocio is that it captures the form and a structure and a shape. Um, and we always try to, to put, put the aesthetic uh, front, front and forward. So this is out in um, Isitan, which is a luxury department store chain out in Japan, in Tokyo. What, 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 well, actually, one of the first adopters of ours was Liberties in London, that was the very first buyer, but thereafter the Japanese embraced this pretty quickly. And, and w I, kinda, I, I loved the opportunity, but, but what I didn't like about that market was the standards were immensely high. I mean, to sell anything into Japan really um, w w was a challenge, especially a handmade product. But um, we, we accomplished it and um, it, it set the bar for us going forward uh, when we entered into new markets. So again, a couple more displays. That's um, in, in Izitan in Japan in Tokyo, and this is in uh, Le Bon Marché in uh, the, the, the left bank in Paris. 
We, we, we start, uh, sorry, we, we, we started off with, with one bag, I think, I think it was this one, and, um, uh, and I remember the buyer coming to me in Paris and saying, Hamish, we're just going to start, we're going to try, we're not sure if this is going to work for us, so we'll, we'll take a bag. I said, okay. So, so um, roll, roll on two seasons, and she came to see me in an appointment, and she said, Hamish, I'd like to place an order, I said, fantastic, how's it going, yeah, great. And um, she started ordering a few more styles, and I, I didn't really take much notice. And um, then she said, um, have you been to the store? And I said, no, no, no I haven't had a chance, so, so you must come to the store. So I went, <laughs> and we'd kind of grown a little bit, so it, it was exciting to see. Um, yeah. Okay, so I mentioned at the outset, um, for me, it was all about um, aesthetic, beauty. Um, I wasn't too bothered whether somebody had the practicality, the utility of a nice handbag to carry all their iPhones and stuff. I didn't really didn't care about that. It was a distant second. What was important to me was to create something that was sustainable, lasting for the long term, and was beautiful just to look at. So the essence of Reseal, even to this day, before we get into the tech, is to create those things that people can look at and enjoy um, and to do it in a sustainable way with the sustainable materials. Um, and so ab about two or three years ago, we, we um, received an award from Zero Waste Scotland because what we were doing, e even before we went down the Tech Avenue was, we wanted to um, recycle, reuse, using a wood that had a structure and a form, it was also very easy for us to design in re recyclability and to reuse. And, and if people damaged their bags, we could we could restore them. So as a result of all our initiatives, Cedar Way Scotland um, gave us an award. It was one of the first Circular Economy Awards um, in 2019, so fantastic. But on the back of that, we wanted to take it further. And from a production perspective, obviously we consume, even though it's sustainable and it's fast growing, the species we use, we still have off cuts and pieces. And so we wanted to reduce that impact and um, and make, it more, make, make the whole process more efficient, not, not just um, the, the, the production. So we approached um, Scottish Enterprise, we spoke to tech people, Bill Corr, and amongst others, and we, we are actually an account managed company with Scottish Enterprise. And so we reached out to these people um, and the people at Zero Waste, and we were put in touch with the AFRC group in Glasgow. And um, what, one of their missions is basically they have the technology, they have the capabilities, and they have the, the engineering. And so the brief that I gave them was, look, I, I want to retain the essence of Reseal, which is the form, the structure, the shape. That's our identity. Um, but I want to use a material which is we can scale, but it's very efficient and it reduces waste even further, rather than us creating a prototype made of wood. Um, even though I would make my prototypes a third of the size to reduce consumption, we wanted a process. And you can, you can imagine, we, we, when you make something by hand um, and you're making it for clients, luxury department stores or the Guggenheim, <laughs> they, they don't have much of a tolerance for error. So we, we had to try and, and come up with ways whereby that I could have consistency to my designs and, and keep that same quality. So spoke to AFRC Group um, and 3D printing company, uh, Desktop Metal in the US, and um, the brief was retain the, the identity of the aesthetic, the shape, the form, the structure, which the wood gave us, and reduce uh, our production. These are the first prototypes. These are the first prototypes that uh, the AFRC Group in Glasgow created for us on the table in, in, in front there is a, one of our signature designs you saw at the beginning of the slides. It's, it's a core uh, bag for, for Reseal. We, we do it in about over 30 countries. Um, so we thought, what better place to start than to use something that is that people know, or existing buyers know is a Reseal design. Yeah, and, and, and obviously the, the, the brief was, it, it couldn't weigh a ton, <laughs> but it also had to, to feel as if of substance. So, so there was quite a lot going into it, as you can imagine. Um, we, we needed to make sure the material was uh, biodegradable, recyclable, and so on and so forth, but also, also had a, a, a weight and, and all those other um, requirements. And then 
so, so we, we don't want to replace the wood. You see a wooden bag there, that, that's hand carved. Um, but what this allows us to do is to, to have a 3D mould um, and it allows us then to be able to wrap it in different leather. So, so if a buyer comes to me and says, hey, I want this Pantone parfait pink or whatever it is, we can work to Pantone, we can speak to the, the Scottish Leather Group, we can speak to, to Alan, his team, we can speak to these partners, get them on board and say, right, um, here's the shapes that we have and, and we want to wrap it in this, this line of leathers or this line of, it can, it can literally be any textile. So this is a proof of principle, that was the first one we created and we exported it in Glasgow at Christmas time uh, at the NMIS exhibition in Glasgow. That's just been wrapped in a, I think it's a calf leather or, or, or um, leather, but again, we, 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 can use, um, we can use vegan leathers. So it, it's just a proof of principle. That's it. That's me, thank you. Thanks so much uh, for that, Hamish. Again, very beautiful, and I think if, if that's the future of fashion, then we should, we should all be pretty excited. So our, our final speaker uh, comes from another world leading design school, much closer to home this time. Um, having received his MA in textiles from Glasgow School of Art, he now oversees the Centre for Advanced Textiles there, um, a centre which he, in fact, played a hand in setting up and establishing. But before setting up this Centre for Advanced Textiles, Alan spent four years with Timorous Beasties overseeing print production and finishing. Um, a brand I'm sure you're all, you're all very familiar with. I know I've walked past the, the shop loads of times drooling in the, the window. Um, so with an absolute abundance of textile and printing and technology knowledge, please give it up for our, our final speaker, Alan Shaw. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks to Abby and Susie for the invite. Um, it's, a, it's, it's lovely to be asked to come along. Um, I just thought I'd kind of go back a little bit and just sort of explain how it came about. Um, not, unlike um, Lennon Hamish, I didn't set out to start up a, a kind of a, a company to make products. I think my experience when I was a GSC, GSA student, an undergraduate, that's kind of what, where we were all heading towards. But what I found that when I went out into industry, I found that textiles and, and print specifically, which is what I graduated in, was, seemed to be a long way behind some of the other um, disciplines in the art school. So I found that my digital skills were way behind. I mean, my whole undergrad was making marks with very simple things, exposing screens, printing fabric in a very analog way, which hadn't changed very much for a very long time. So when I went out into the industry, I felt that compared to some other areas, um, I was a bit behind where I wanted to be. And I realized that there was quite a lot of new work being done with digital technology with, to print that I was really keen to be involved in. So I came back to the art school and I, I undertook an MA, um, a master's in design, at what it was called, looking at that technology, how it was being applied, who could access it. Because one of the things that I found most frustrating when I graduated as a textile student was the lack of being able to produce textiles when you, when you left college. Um, you had to go to a big factory in, in the north of England normally and produce 500 metres of a design in one colour at one scale and exp spend a whole lot of money. And, you know, I'd been to trade fairs, people were interested in my work. It was either set up a studio yourself or go to a factory. So I, I was looking at ways that I could sort of try and improve on that situation. So I, I went back to GSA and I spent most of the, my postgrad working at a company called Coates Viella in England, who were a massive um, supplier to Marks and Spencers at the time. And they were looking at this digital technology in a way of prototyping designs to sort of um, speed up the supply chain and offer more possibilities. So I spent a lot of time there uh, working for them and learning the technology, which was very cutting edge at the point. This was back in 1999, old. Um, 
and I came back to Glasgow School of Art and the, the, the school thought it'd be great if we could have a, some sort of facility at the school where we could offer that to students, which is what I really wanted to do, was to offer a service to students when they were at GSA and also when they, when they graduated, to allow them to do the thing that I couldn't do when I graduated, was to produce small runs of printed textile. So I ended up with some other people at the time putting a bid together and we got awarded £661,000, I think, from Shefka, which is the Scottish Higher Education Funding Committee, to buy, at that time, the world's first digital production printer, which sounds amazing. <laughs> Don't ever buy the world's first anything, um, especially if it costs a lot of money, because there's lots of reasons so that it might not just be um, just ready to go. Um, so that's just a wee bit of background. So that we, I, we bought the first printer in 1999. I set up CAT um, in 2000. We built a custom space, um, and we've moved it about over the years for various things that's happened at GSA's buildings being um, moved or whatever. So we're in the Reed building at the moment, but we've been in other places, and CAT has kind of stuck true to what I wanted it to be in the beginning, which was a resource for students primarily, um, but also a facility where students, when they graduate, could come back and produce work um, for whatever reason, but also as a facility, and I've ended up working with people that, um, all over the world who needed to access that facility for commercial purposes. So um, when Susie had contacted me and Abby about this, I thought I would focus on a project that kind of ticked most of the boxes in terms of collaboration, innovation, um, and it was a project that we worked on together with uh, Lynn Hi-Fi, Timorous Beasties, Butte Fabrics and Glen Isla Kilts. I was just saying to Hamish earlier on, it was a great project. I don't get up every day and, and try and start one of these projects because it's quite difficult, but it was a project that really pushed us and, and made us work with people and do things that we'd never done before. Um, so I'll just... The first picture actually is... first picture is, um, so as you can see, one of the speaker covers. And we were approached by Lynn um, to try and develop product with them. And they actually were asking us, first of all, you know, who do you think we could work with? Who, who, could, um, who could design these products for us? They were thinking about reintroducing some old Liberty prints, different things. And I said, you know, they would ask me about people that we work with who were kind of quite cutting edge. And of course, I had my experience working with Timorous Beasties for a few years. I said, you know, Timorous might be interested. So we kind of put, put them together with Timorous. Timorous were keen on the idea. Um, and, but they also, to throw another kind of very difficult equation into the mix, where they wanted to work onto Scottish woven wool to produce speaker covers for these very expensive speakers, um, of which we could be ch interchangeable. Um, so that threw up quite a few. We, we, we worked with Timber Species for years. I know them very well. Um, so that wasn't a problem working with them. But we'd never really printed onto this base fabric before. And wool is a very difficult fabric to print onto. Um, so we had to do quite a lot of kind of more chemistry-based kind of analysis of the wool and how to get our print to, to work within it. Um, one of the other big... Um, technical challenges was, I don't know if anybody's ever been out to Lynn Hi-Fi's um, production plant in the south of Glasgow, it's, it's amazing, um, where they've got a really amazing room this size with about 20 to 30 technical people working on sound engineering. And the first, I've got a couple of samples over on, my, over on the desk that people can look at after. The first wool that we were working with was a really nice kind of waffle kind of type wool. Um, and they realized qu quite soon that that, I mean, wrapping a speaker in wool a bit of a crazy idea. If you look at any of the speakers in here, there's not a lot of wool around them because wool is actually a soundproofing agent. Um, so acoustically, it wasn't working quite right. So we had to look at that and redevelop um, it from a sound point of view. That, that wasn't really my job, but it involved us, the weavers getting on board and looking at a weave structure that allowed the sound to move through the wool better than the waffle structure. So that was a learning curve for me. I'd never come across that before, but my big problem was trying to get good colour into wool is very, very difficult. There's a lot of pre-processing that goes on to get a dye stuff into wool because wool's designed as a sheep's clothing. So its main purpose is not to allow that moisture in in the first place. So that's the big obstacle. Um, so, so, as I say, that's the kind of final product. But um, I'll show you a couple more pictures of it. Um, processing. 
this is uh, the wool, so the process is that the wool gets woven, then what normally happens, and most of you will be quite familiar with it, wool, um, you, you've noticed probably when you're buying any cashmere jumpers in recently that they're more shrink resistant than they used to be. So you can machine wash wool that you couldn't have washed before. And it's all about, at a microscopic level, removing the scales or making the wool more stable when it's being washed. But it's a twofold thing because when you do that, you also open up the fibres to receive the dye much better. Now, that's normally traditionally been done in Italy, and it's a process called chlorination, which isn't terribly environmentally friendly. But we were working with some scientists in Leeds who were helping us come up with an alternative method, which is called delipidization. Um, which we were able to do in the UK, which did a similar thing, but it had less of, a, less of a footprint. So that all had to happen, first of all. Then the fabric was sent to another factory where it was, get, where it was singed to remove some of the surface fibre, another reason that wool's not great to print onto. Then we had to have it prepared with a chemical coating, which enables the dye stuff to become permanent. Then the fabric's printed. Then the fabric gets fixated through a steam bath, and then it gets... This is actually a picture of it going through one of our wash um, dye baths um, where we're washing off the excess dye and the, the, some of the chemical residue. Um, there's a really good video on Vimeo. If you, if you Google Timorous Beastie Lynn Hi-Fi Speaker Project, this is part of a video, and it shows you... They, are all, they were also analogue printing the wool with um, through screen at the same time, so it's actually really interesting little thing to watch. That's the fabric actually on the printer. Um, it was a real challenge because it was a twill, the fabric that we ended up working with was a twill design and it had real problems with moving all over the place and we were printing these very kind of specific shapes that had to, the kilt maker I think was ready for throttle in us because he had never came across a fabric that had as much skew and, and, and movement to it, and he was trying to make these beautiful covers that zipped up perfectly and pattern matched on the back. So <laughs> it was really, really challenging to try and put them through a digital printer where there's no kind of room for error. Um, and there was about 20 or 30 different designs that Len would, would get orders for and then just send us the orders and we would be printing off maybe only maybe five or 10 units at a time. Um, but it was just... It was a really fantastic thing to be involved in, but it was really challenging compared to the way that we normally process orders. Um, I think this, the last slide is just some little details. But I say it's better, I think, if you come um, come over afterwards and have a little look at the samples, and you can see the the quality of the print that we managed to achieve in the end. Um, so we still, you know, that was a couple of years. That was a few years ago now. And as I say, not every project we do has that kind of intensity in, in collaboration, innovation, and the challenges that it throws up. But you know, I was just saying earlier on, those kind of products, even though at the time you don't know how you're going to get it done, you learn a lot for future things. And it kind of gives you a lot of information that you can apply to you know, a, a project I'm doing just now, actually. Um, so at the time, they seem really challenging, but they're really good for the future. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Alan. I'll just uh, check how much time we've got for, for Q&A. Um, yeah, it's interesting some of the, the points that came up across, across, across the different presentations. And although you've got very different products, different, different technologies, different approaches, there, there was definitely some commonality uh, there. Uh, one thing that stood, stood out for me was the, the idea between using these products are, are very natural. I think, Lynn, you, you touched on it when you talked about yeah, craft, craft sensibility and how that's important from a sort of market point of view in terms of adding value. And then, but the ch challenges Hamish faced when it came to these markets with, with sky high expectations and the, the need for consistency. And then, yeah, the, working with these natural materials, Alan, and the, the challenges that you, fa you faced around that. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if I could, I could get you guys to tell us a little bit more about that balance between the craft sensibility and technology, maybe from from a market point of view, and how, how you think uh, the, pe the people that are looking to, to consume high-end luxury fashion view that, and then perhaps from sort of the practicalities of, of merging these two, two worlds. Uh, Lynn, can I, do you get any thoughts on that? Yeah, my um, 
I think one of the reasons I feel uh, my craft sensibilities, if you like, do elevate my products. Um, a lot of 3D printed items come out very kind of have a ubiquity of surface and finish. Um, so bringing in the hand dyeing, especially the gradients and the dip dyeing process, I think really brings an extra um, dimension to those. Um, and I think obviously there has been a turn back to the appreciation of craftsmanship in the last, I don't know however long, a few years longer than that. Um, people, and I think that goes hand in hand with sustainability as well. Um, trying to have objects that are more special, more carefully made, that we can keep for longer um, as well. Yeah, thanks Lynn. Uh, Hamish, can you tell us a little bit about your experience? You obviously had to yeah. manage that, that pretty closely. Yep, um, I echo Lynn's sentiments there. I mean, from the get-go, I, I would never get involved unless we could, we could find a sustainable uh, material. So that, that was number one. Um, that was the first question out of the box. Um, and um, w w when we knew that we, we had found this fast growing, rapidly growing, it was eight to ten years fully grown, and we could use this, and, it, in, in, and the species that we started with um, is, is generally available. I mean, there's thousands of species of it all over the world, so we, we could get access to it, and, and that was the starting point. Uh, as we went forward, um, we would convey the story about you know the, the process, the sustainability, the, the, the long term, the design, so that we could reuse, refurb, service your bag. And even to this day, we, we, we get emails almost every day from clients around the world who say, um, you know, I've had this bag for how many seasons? C can, could you do this and could you do that? And yep, we'll pick it up, we'll look after it. So it's even more so now, um, it, it's more and more demands. Customers are, or clients are becoming more educated. The, the green um, it, great to see uh, that, that it's becoming more, um, it's one of those boxes you have to tick now um, for, from the clients, consumers, from the buyers and the buying offices, you, you have to have this ESG component so it's front and centre and it's something we take great pride in and like I say we, we were the first company in Scotland to win the Circular Economy Award uh, which is all about you know that, that, that circle and, and, and um, reusing so with, with the technology coming in um, it allows us the opportunity um, to like I say, scale, but also to even further reduce um, our consumption. And, and so that's why it's a really exciting for us. And, and from a creative, innovative um, direction, the, the tech um, allows me to really, um, you know, come up, to really explore and push the boundaries of what we can achieve um, with, um, you know, creating this, this structure and, and how we can complement it with this infinite amounts of different materials and colours and, and, and you know, so it's just really opened up um, things that we were limited and restricted to in the past. We've now got this opportunity to, to take our essence and our spirit of this structure and, 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 and uh, do collaborations where it's with Timothy Beasties and Alan or Lynn or whatever. We, we can do a whole host of things now and, and we've built that over the years. We've built that um, the buyers now come back to us I think primarily because of the sustainability, but, but also because of the, the creativity. So, yeah. Thanks, Amos. Alan, Alan who yeah, that I mean, part? I think like everybody else, we're very aware recently of um, customers now coming, clients coming to us and wanting to know much more about the product that they're getting in terms of sustainability. Um, I, I don't think a lot of it's quite there yet. There's a lot of noise around. Um, in textiles, I, I find that a lot of people are just going to want to tick a box. Um, I'm not sure because, because this whole supply chain is so incredibly difficult. I mean, what we do isn't necessarily organic or got certi certificated, but everything that we do in a footprint sense is a complete revolution and compared to what the analog printing systems were where you're exposing screens, um, you're printing much more than you generally need to get a, a, a price, you're wasting huge amounts of ink, and it's the chemicals that you would use to make those screens. Um, I mean, it's worth pointing out that the digital textile printing probably only accounts for 5 to 10% of the global market. It's still a small thing in its infancy, but it's growing every year. But, but I do think that Every, every element of what we do, I mean, the machines that we use exchange heat 
when we're doing the washing and the steaming. But it still, um, it still can be approved. I don't think it's there yet. I mean, I get lots of phone calls with people ringing up saying, do you print with organic dyes? And, and it's that we don't. But, um, you know, the machines don't print a drop more than they need to. And, um, you know, people, it just gives so much more kind of choice. And as, and as Hamish was sort of explaining earlier on about we can print tiny small amounts of fabric for people really quickly and let them make informed decisions much quicker than what they would have done before. So there's much less wastage and wastage of time. Whether or not there's a counter argument that it allows people to come up with far more ideas than they ever could in the first place, I don't know, but um, that's maybe another argument. But I think it's moving towards that. And I, you know, it's, it can only be a good thing for the students coming through and seeing that technology, that then that's what they're going and using in industry. Yeah, thanks for that. It's interesting you all touched on the, the link between the technology and sustainability, like either reducing waste in different ways. How much do you think technology ha sort of inspires your creativity? Do you, do you actively seek out new technologies to help you generate diff different approaches to your work? Yeah, I think most of my creative ideas I've had um, in the last 10 years definitely come from this particular material and the properties of that and um, that's what's kind of stimulated all my ideas and I also bring in obviously the things I'm interested in um, apart from that like colour and pattern um, but a lot of it um, started out just the lightness of the material and um, a lot of my designs are hollow as well so that I could suddenly do quite large pieces after previously working in a lot of metal and um, precious metal, I could suddenly do quite large theatrical pieces. Um, and even the smaller pieces are so much more wearable um, because they are so light. Um, and also just exploring things like the precision, meant the patterns and things. Um, I kind of looked at different optical effects that can kind of be easily achieved um, because of the precision of the, t of the process. Um, also, yeah, the capability of dyeing it and how I've explored that. So it is my kind of main point of the properties and the potential of this process and this material really have informed most of my design work um, over the last 10 years. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hey, hey, Miss, you were obviously really proactive in going after this uh, grant from, from Zero Waste Scotland. And, um, AFRC in this? Yeah, I th I mean, we're excited. I mean, I, I've just been always striving for a solution for efficiency. I mean, it's, it's you know, tired of standing in, in, in these shows and, and, and speaking to buyers who want everything yesterday. And, and they want, you know, they, they, their whole, they're all about um, profit and money and they, they, they want multiple collections every season, a, a pre-collection, a main collection, a, a summer collection, a resort collection, a, any excuse to, to, to just you know, flood the market and, and turn, turn a buck in effect. And we were just listening to this and I would just you know, say, look, we're not for you. You know, we, 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 are, you know, we make over a period of time and, um, and that's it and your bags will be ready in three to four months. So, so, so that kind of narrowed down, and but, but that that was good for us. That, 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 that was so. That's always been our approach, and, and the buyers became aware of that. We're just going back onto the point there about the tech. I mean, n now rather than me making prototypes and, and, and kiln drying wood and, 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 and so on and taking that preparation time, I can go on and with, with AFRC Group's expertise that they've given me now and, and, and the solid works and the computer aided design programs and. I can have a play, and I and I can really, you know, I can see within within an hour or two, I can see is this design going to work? Is this is this going to transfer from 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 my sketch to a physical product? And 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 so I can have a play, our team can have a play, and and we can work with buyers to create things specific for them, whether it's for I don't know um, Rolls Royce or, or whoever it is brands that want something a little bit more bespoke. It gives us a flexibility. It gives us this phen phenomenal um, array of, of, of this tech that, um, that, um, that, that, that we can then, w without having to consume materials and, 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 and rejects and, and, and so on and so forth, we have, you know, the design element that, um, is just a fabulous thing for, for us. So, yeah. 
Thanks. Uh, Alan, what about the businesses you work with? Do you find they're quite open to new technologies or, or being experimental? How might they go about find, finding out about this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, we have a real kind of range of clients from the students at GSA to, you know, companies nationally, internationally. Um, I think, you know, there's lots of new kind of trends and things coming through with fabrics, but quite a lot of our, even though what we do is, is, ver is very digital in a printing sense, there's quite a lot of it, what we still do is analog, and quite a lot of our suppliers are still quite analog, so we're kind of like one little part of, of the process which has kind of been revolutionized, but quite a lot of the machines that prepare that fabric or process it afterwards are the same that they've been for hundreds of years. So there's kind of limitations, I suppose, in what you can do, but in a very s simple sense, you know, the way that I trained as a print designer was I was aware of manufacturing processes which informed how I would design and what I could do. And that's kind of been just, you know, ripped up because now what students can, and even just having access to digital tools, people, you know, having, you know, I, I work with clients who produce things with me that don't come from traditional design backgrounds or, or, or you know, pathways that, you know, I'm working with little old ladies up in the Shetland Islands who want to design a range of tea cosies for their local thing based on photography that they've taken locally that they can wee transfer over to me that afternoon and I can send a sample up in a couple of days. You know, that's the sort of thing that, that changes it for, you know, for people like that. So it, it does inspire people that you wouldn't normally and, and opens it up to people that normally wouldn't have access to that type of production. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering if I can put, put a question out this way to you guys. Like, how have you found new technologies for your businesses? Do you, have you managed to find funding to support that process if it's risky or innovative? <coughs> Has anybody been using, using any um, technologies in their business or got any interest and insights into finding funding? my friend here about uh, digital fashion and uh, when I went into digital fashion in 2016 it was still <coughs> very very new nobody knew about that and when I started exploring taking digital fashion into gamification that is having an opportunity to present it in virtual reality um, that was way back in 2016 and um, now coming into this age where you now have um, the, the Quest 2 that is not easily accessible because when I got into um, trying to create for VR, uh, <laughs> having um, a virtual reality experience required a separate like warehouse with machines <laughs> and, and a big, it was a big, big deal when you have to use virtual reality and, and um, just a few years down the line, Mark <laughs> does the best thing he does, <laughs> picks up a technology and um, makes it um, easily mass accessible. And I, I was telling her that where I'm thinking, where I see digital fashion, virtual reality is still, we're still scratching the surface. We're talking about NFTs now, 3D assets. Everybody's asking for the NFT market for fashion now. What is the use, use, use case scenario? Everybody's picking up NFTs now. How do we use what we're, we're, we're buying? And uh, these NFTs cost money. It's not, it's, one Ethereum is not cheap, you know, it's a lot of money. And everybody is picking up this body um, art and stuff and you're just keeping them on your phone. Where, when are we going to get to a part where we're going to be able to um, display our NFTs in real time? And now we're talking about artificial um, augmented reality. We're talking about the AR glasses. If we do not get mass adoption, we're never going to be able to cut down the cost, reduce the production, cut down fast fashion, and be able to get everybody on board. Because now you talk about digital fashion to the traditional fashion center, and I did pattern drafting and sewing, so I know the process. And, and I needed to learn it to be able to go into technology to use those, those design softwares. When we talk about digital fashion and technology, people are always like, <gasps> the traditional designers, they're always scared, like, oh, you're about to steal our jobs, you're about to <laughs> take this away from us. No, we're trying to bring it to the basics where your cost of production is 
marginally, significantly reduced and open up that space for new designers. And this is the creator's economy. We're no more longer in that age where uh, the, the designers or the design house can influence what the consumer wants to wear. We now decide what we want to wear. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm just excited about this kind of conversations because yeah. it lets me know that we're thinking, there are a lot of people thinking about this circular economy. Um, you're talking about um, dyeing, the process, and looking for organic dye. There is organic dyeing. You can use the hibiscus flower for the red dyes. Back in um, Nigeria, they used the, the indigo pits, and these pits are so sustainable that you can actually drink from the dying pits because they have healing benefits. And, and these are the options and opportunities that are bound so that we can take back and shine the light back to the, the communities and indigenous from grassroots where they have worked hard on this. It is not new, sustainability has always been, nature has always provided. And we just need to shine that light back and give um, that um, honor to where the traditional handcrafters are in while we now move into technology and into the future. Yeah, um, th thanks for that. Yeah, mate. This, the the <laughs> NFT stuff came up earlier on, and Hamish got very excited about that. Yeah. It's all above my yeah. head, I've got to be honest. Listen, but yeah. Yeah, no, just to, to, to add that, love it. I mean, love it, really. Yeah. I, I find it, it's kind of it, th this new digital year, especially non fungible tokens, and, and allows artists really to, to broaden our reach. And, and, and for, from our perspective, we're not going to consume the materials, we'll consume time. So a graphic artist, I say, okay, there's a few hours, let's, let's get busy. I don't have to start, you know, using sustainable materials or, or, or even, or, or, or dyes or paint, nothing. And, and what we're exploring and have been for a little while is so, yes, you can buy one of our designs, but with that, we'll give you the NFT. And, and I think, so, so I love your direction there. And I, and I think it's a balance, isn't it? I think, I think there's the old guard right now, which you're right, people are a little bit scared and, and not quite sure. And, and, and then there's the new, the, the Gen Z, and they all really have this appetite. Um, and, it, and it really does add to the creativity. So, so I, I, I love this. I, I'm really excited about it. As a company, as a brand, we're all over it. <laughs> we're trying to educate it. And... and Right, right, and so, and so when you buy a Coco or an Aphrodite, one of our bags, that hopefully soon you'll be able to get the NFT to go with it. And, and as you know, but non-fungible means it's a one-off. Yeah. And so it adds value, so, so it's going to bring a lot more money, um, and for, for, you know, the, the market's going to grow, from, from struggling artists are, are going to start to get a return, and in brands like ours, we're, we're, we're going to see more and more of an appetite, more of a demand for the products. Um, so yeah, no, I, I love the NFT space and, and the whole and Ethereum. Yeah, it's getting a little bit lower. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, but uh, no, no. So we're we're on it. So. Does we have another point from that table? Well, can I just can I just add on on, on the 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 metaverse? I think that there's another part and um, the sandbox, the central land, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of them, and we we see brands Gucci. I think a few months ago announced that um, they're setting up a showroom, a, a, a virtual reality showroom on the sandbox, I think. So, so we're kind of looking at it as well and thinking, you know, it's a great opportunity um, to get involved in the metaverse and, and monetize so, yes. yeah, and have a broader reach. So. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> very exciting and I kind of wonder how I can kind of use it in my work and we've got this kind of dual future ahead of us but there's still a resource issue with NFTs um, with the energy, energy footprint yeah. um, although I know some cryptocurrencies are looking at being a lot more environmental so I don't know what do you think about that in terms of you want to be a environmental like sustainable brand have you thought about that side of it at all because yeah, i mean it's interesting to me but it, yeah. but it puts me off a bit i mean the sort of energy crisis is the crux of the climate yeah uh, listen i think i think correct and it's something that you have to we have to to look at um, proof of state proof of work energy consumption um there are they are transitioning it, it has become a massive issue and um and so so the energy consumption is dramatically being reduced um, but it's not doing far enough. 
They're using renewables, um, so, so again, the type of energy they're using, they're transitioning away. They're not now really allowed. I mean, every month, I think they're coming out with, there, there's a new minister stepping up or, or, or a governor in a state of whatever it is in Texas saying, you know, renewables percentage is, is growing and, and they now want to embrace this digital economy. So it's a valid point. It's something that definitely um, we, we won't be using it unless that, um, that, 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 that the consumption of the energy is brought down and it's renewable source, et cetera, et cetera. But I think when you weigh it up against the physical consumption of material consumption and, and, and the labour and the energy that's used through that and then the, the shipping of the goods and the return of the goods and the repair of the goods, I mean, it's pr before you know it, you've got, you, you've got an argument to say, actually, that, that this... This digital has, has immense value and um, there's a great marketing case. Yeah, I do agree. I think it is a sort of solvable problem, a more solvable problem than a lot of other using physical resources and things like that. But I was just wondering how much you sort of... I, 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 that. I, I want to see Scotland embrace it. I really do. Like Nigeria, I, I think... I know Nigeria is big in the crypto. I know that. I keep my eyes on, on these countries. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Scotland really needs to... You know, love to, 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 to see that becoming a course or something and, and where there's the education and the knowledge because in terms of the art world, it's here, it's happening and, and we really need to embrace that. So, yeah, exciting. Yeah, this is all really interesting. A little bit new to me, I've got, got to admit, but very, very interesting and great to see so much enthusiasm about it. Thank you for that, Yemi. That was beautiful, really. Thank you. And I think we've got more questions from your table or more points that people want to raise. for this. Um, but yeah, um, I just want to bring back to the point of um, looking for opportunities to get into this space. Um, I received funding from Creative Scotland's Stay C Share Fund last year to do research into digital fashion, NFTs and the metaverse. Um, and I think it was through lockdown, everybody was stuck at home. So um, digital fashion really had a moment and it offered real connection with people. Um, I was able to interview really kind of interesting and innovative people in the digital fashion space um, all over, who were based all over the world. So I was able to kind of just have an hour long Zoom with them or half an hour Zoom with them. And um, it was, yeah, just amazing to get that um, really quick interaction with people and you really felt like you were, yeah, in the room with them. Um, so our project was looking at, the research project was looking at the potential um, new marketplaces, so it was looking at metaverse, it was looking at proof of stake, proof of work. Um, we came across, it basically resulted in a live project um, creating digital fashion. So we, I worked with um, a team of three of us digitally reproduced the work of three Scottish based designers. Um, so we had all kind of taught ourselves Clothe 3D, um, which is a um, digital pattern cutting software. So we recreated the work um, and minted them as NFTs on a carbon neutral blockchain um, just to kind of go through the process and see what was involved and we learned loads along the way um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely that thing of you've got to kind of get into it and get into the project to be able to kind of understand the possibilities and there's always n completely new things that just come out of, out of the blue. Um, but yeah, so we received funding from Creative Scotland and then Scotland redesigned as well. So we, we, um, we kind of previewed the uh, digital fashion kind of film and also augmented reality filters of the clothing um, because it's that thing of um, you don't want to encourage being stuck behind a screen any more than we already are. So AR is a really interesting way of kind of bringing it into your space. So we, cre we kind of embedded the 3D models that we created of the garments in, um, in a QR code um, that I can share. If anyone wants to see them, I've got the QR code on my phone, so um, I can share it. So it just brings um, the, the digital fashion into kind of your own space and just creates another level. So like Yemi was saying, um, it's not there to kind of replace anything it's kind of it's an adding a new dimension and adding another another kind of layer onto fashion so yeah i'm really excited about um about what scotland can bring and what um yeah people are doing in scotland so yeah yeah it, so, it sounds like there's potentially a whole other event just on that yeah. topic <laughs> uh, 
is there anybody else itching with a question? If not, I've got, got some more practical questions. I'm going to take things down another route about adv advice that you might have for, for businesses that are starting up in this space that have got ideas about, about being creative with technologies. If you were, were to go back to, to when you first started out, what would have been really useful for you to know that you've, you, you've now sort of learned? You've got some gems. Um, well, I mean, I think there's never been a more exciting time to get involved um, in the creative space than there is today, not just with the digital um, side. I think there's, there's a lot more awareness um, today through you know, reaching out to whether it's Scottish, Scottish Edge, um, Scale Up Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Development International. There, there, there's a whole host, and I'm sure Alan and Lynn know others, um, that can help you, you know, start your journey. Um, and, I, and I think that, that when, when we first started, it was, it was quite localised, but now it's growth by internationalisation. Now the digital world it, it allows you to, to have global reach. And whereas before you might have thought that actually my idea around the coffee table is probably not going to fly, now, now you've got the capacity to, to go online, to do your research online, to have a look at markets all around the world, to have a look at stores all around the world, see what they're buying, see what the consumer tastes and trends are, bring all that knowledge back and, and use that as part of the development process here in Scotland or anywhere for that matter. And, and so it's an exciting time and there is a lot of support out there um, in the business community, innovative uh, space and, and, and just go for it. Don't, don't, don't be scared to, to, to like, like we, we spoke there, th there's a lot of people who tend to, to kind of go through the motions and, and eventually ultimately get nowhere. And, and I think I would always say, um, just start. Start the creation process, whether it's a drawing, a design, whether it's weaving, whether it's creating a 3D printing, whatever it is, just start making, physically making a product and, and, and get it out there. And you will learn and, and, and you, you, you'll become that artist as opposed to talking about it, debating it, writing business plans or whatever. You, you, you ultimately, it will just it will drift. So my advice is get out there, now's the time. And uh, but physically start making, and, and and you will make mistakes and you'll fail, for sure. But you you will learn and and you will eventually succeed. So that's my advice. You got anything to add to that, Lynn? I just kind of echo that. Really, you just need to start and keep going. Keep trying to improve all the time. I'm still trying to improve. I still well, probably in a bit more of a fledgling um, business in a way, but. Um, yeah, it can be a slow process, but you've just got to keep getting that um, feedback and keep keep going, basically. I think that's all I can say about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, loads of good nuggets in there. So feedback, just get going and, and look, look for support. And I think once you've got the right thing and something that people love, a lot of the other stuff will fall into place. Like You can learn about, and I have tried <laughs> to learn about marketing and all sorts of things, but I think as well what Hamish was saying at the start in his presentation, his main thing was just to make something beautiful, like a piece of art, and, and let, if it's not covetable, it can be sustainable and as clever as you like, but if it's not covetable, um, you're not going to get very far, and once you've suddenly struck on that covetable item, I think a lot of the other stuff can fall into place, but you're not going to do it straight off the bat, unless you're very lucky. Mm -hmm. It takes time to kind of work that out. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about the failure, about the risk, about it not always working first time. And yeah, just being able to learn from that and embrace it, because I think it's, it's quite a scary thing, but it's also kind of inevitable and healthy and part of the learning. And I think some of the grant funding is really there to kind of underpin and support some of that. So some of it's easily accessible, some of it's really competitive. But I think, yeah, if you're, you're interested in grant funding or you want to do something that's risky and innovative, come and chat to us. Um, I think that's my colleague at the back there. I'm not sure. I've only met him online, <laughs> but he'd, he'll be able to help you as well, uh, Demetrius. Um, no, another thing I was just going to add is the traditional uh, route to market used to be just okay. So you create a collection, and then it's the trade fairs or exhibitions uh, with the cost and travel and so on and so forth. N now you don't you don't need to go down that path anymore. I mean, it, it, what we've learned through COVID is that now there there's um, the, the, the trade shows, the traditional method to market, um, it, it's not a be on end all. So it's an opportunity now, and, 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 and the arms are wide open now. People will happily just receive your lookbooks, your line sheets digitally, 
Um, before, when I first made my first ever sale, I remember um, sending a lookbook and a line sheet down to Sarah da Piano in Liberties, and, and it was pretty much rebuffed instantly. You know, within a couple of days, okay, thanks, but no thanks. It looks nice, but great. And then, then a week later, I don't know, she, 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 her, her boss saw one of her bags, somebody's having breakfast down in London, and I hadn't even taken her out my speed dial, and, and, I, and I got a phone call that week to say, hey, was a little bit hasty, could you bring a couple of samples down to London physically? But now with the change, in, in, in like I say, um, buyers don't need to, to pick things up and touch it. They, they, they're quite happy now, send me a sample, but send me a lookbook. So you don't, you don't have the same costs, there's not the same barriers as there was all those years ago where you had to jump on a train or a plane and, and, and rent a space or a showroom and physical samples. And, and you can now create a few designs and, and, and you can Photoshop, you can do some editing and you can have a full collection and a lookbook and a line sheet, and, and the appetite's there from the buyers and the buying offices to receive that digital uh, lookbook and line sheet. So it's a great time to get involved for a really minimal outlay. Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. Can I, can I come to you? Can you tell us a bit about how businesses that might be interested, so, so very small companies, not lots of experience, how might they work with somebody like you to, to do low production runs? How, how would that work? How would it be funded? Um, yeah, I mean, we work with people from from really big multinational companies sometimes. It surprises me to, like, as I say, little start-up companies quite often. Um, I mean, I, I, my advice would be the one, from what I see from the clients that we work with, the ones that are most successful are the ones that are, have got a really good, strong idea that, that's very individual. They communicate their story really well. Um, and they sort of, you know, the providence of their their product and the story that they've got, where it's produced. I mean, I, we got a lot of people now ringing up in the last few years since Brexit wanting to print in Scotland, mm -hmm. which wasn't such a big thing before, but they're really, really keen to do their printing in the UK, but specifically, I mean, that these would be English companies who would want to be printing in Scotland. Um, so, you know, I think the whole story and, uh, you know, the sourcing of your materials, and we're always open as a manufacturer. I mean, that's, that's why I started Cat Up, was to try and turn the table on the huge, um, you know, cost of, of manufacturing, both to the environment and, you know, to the client. We're always open. If somebody comes along tomorrow with an organic dye solution for my printer, I'll be very happy to look at that. We're, we're, we're trying to go down that route. When I say it's not quite there, I still, I mean, we talk about all these things and some of them are kind of coming along, but they haven't actually got fully to the end of the production line yet because it takes time for them to integrate into the, the equipment that's currently out there. Um, as I say, we, we, we bought a new printer last year which um, has got environmental like, impact, which is much less than what they're the printer we bought three or four years ago so it's just moving forward and forward um, and there are things with organic dyes that are coming forward in certain areas but possibly not not coming right through to the market as quickly as what maybe you maybe want them to be for whatever reason I suppose it's a bit like the conversation you could have about petrol and diesel cars you know it's it's not easy just to discard mm -hmm. that technology immediately and move to everybody driving electric cars yeah, I think I think that we is something that we found in manufacturing generally when we're trying to encourage big manufacturers to adopt new technologies. That they might be interested, there might be appetite, but actually they've got all these legacy systems that need to be replaced, or their supply chain has, and it's it's a complicated process. Yeah. Was there a question over here? Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Chris Smith, City of Glasgow College. Um, great advice that you've been sort of giving to the young. Um, some of probably who are in the room, but there are many others who've moved on in within the sector um, to a more senior stage. So what would be your advice to providers of the education, training, HA, HE, FE sort of opportunities for the youngsters coming into these sectors? What would be your advice to us in terms of what we can do to prepare them better, you know, for the journeys that you've been on, perhaps painful, perhaps expensive at time, so that they can get to your stage that much more quickly? Well, um, yeah, from, from our perspective, yeah, I mean, it's been challenging, to say the least, as you can imagine. Um, 
I didn't know I was oil and gas. I'm an oil and gas engineer. I was two stone heavier and I worked with US Navy divers. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm making ladies' handbags. I mean, it was a, it, there was a learning curve there. And, um, and I had to educate myself. And, and, and literally, I just asked a barrel load of questions. At every fair and every buyer and every press or every designer or director that I bumped into in Paris, London, New York, the first, the first season of doing all those uh, kind of circuit um, was just absorbed. I'm just absorbing it and, and answering questions and, and speaking to all whether it's Middle Eastern buyers or Russian buyers or, or, or Asian buyers. What size, type, form, shape, price point, and uh, colours. Uh, and I learned fuchsia was the number one in Middle East and so on. And I've learned in Russia, I've just add a couple of zeros to the price. And, 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 and I got all these techniques and information. Back to your point, um, I, I think that now to be armed with the correct equipment to, to be successful and, and, and to give our, our, our students the, the, what they need, they have to be looking at the digital space. They have to have, they have, to have the knowledge, they have, there has to be courses, there has to be, whether it's YouTube video, bite-sized content on TikTok or YouTube, well, that's what the kids are into and we have to kind of dress it up in that format, feed it to them because that's what they, they'll consume. And we have to visit all these areas, the metaverse, um, the, the, the crypt, uh, cryptocurrencies and, 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 and so on, and, and NFTs, and it definitely has to be a part of it. But we also have to have the traditional, the story, the journey, um, the physical, and um, very important that they understand the source. So, so I think I would just say um, the modules or whatever you want to feed them has to be in, in that consumable style, which is what they're taking the Gen Z are taken and it has to have a balance of um, the finished products, the physical products, and also just the knowledge for the digital space. Yeah, I'd probably just add to that that from a from working from within a college perspective and having come through that system myself, that the more collaboration that the, the students can have with industry, live projects, um, you know, embedding themselves in what's going on in the industry before they leave. It's very easy sometimes to come through a, you know, a three, especially when I when I was a student, but to come through a three or four year degree course and have no real uh, um, understanding of what the industry really is because you get so caught up in producing your own work. So I think I would encourage much more interaction between industry. Cause I've sat on, I've went to like Scottish um, textile association things where I've represented education and there's a so there's a bit that it could be better in terms of, in the textile sector anyway, their collaboration with colleges, and you know, it could be closer. And I think that would be a benefit to students when they leave. Um, no, thanks for that. And that, that last bit really is sort of music to my ears, because I'm the, you know, I've got no background in this at all. I won't even bore you with my maritime background. But what I'm looking at is a, a project with the college to draw as much closer to industry in the way that many universities are, but actually the college sector is not in quite the same way. And of course, we don't have PhD students and you know, master students in the same way. So we have to do something that's much more tailored to the course. But the overall drive of the college is to close up with industry you know, much more closely and create these sort of opportunities. So thank you very much. That was really good. Thank you. OK, yeah, I feel like we could continue this chat all day. But thankfully, we've got some and some biscuits <laughs> so yeah I think if we we can can do that I don't know if, if you've got any final like a nugget that you'd like people to take away from today what what should people be thinking about in terms of the future of fashion yeah you <laughs> I'll just say that I'll just say this um, I wasn't never going to make a living out of selling a uh, wooden handbag in Glasgow so that became quite apparent and there wasn't really going to be the market I reached internationally mm -hmm. right off the bat and I, I would advise people to try to really broaden your horizons. You've got the tools now to do it. Go and look and see what people are buying in Shanghai in, 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 in a department store. You can see that content. You can see all the information you need. And, and so I would, I would always advocate growth by internationalization. And, and then you can, now, you can bring it back from there. But, but that's a great education process. And, and it'll get you up to speed with the trends and what's happening in the industry. Alan, you got a nugget for us? Um, I, th I think probably just to pick up on something maybe Hamish or Lynn said earlier on that, you know, the things that I see coming through our centre 
that I think are the most successful are the things that I think is going to have the most longevity. And I think it's really reassuring when you hear Hamie say that people are bringing bags back to him to get refurbished or reconditioned after owning them for 10 or 15 years. I find that a really positive story. And I, I don't know if... It's, I think I'm hearing more and more about that in the textile world, but there was a period there where I think, and it's still going on, where people are, you know, fast fashion, you know, it's horrible um, the amount of wastage that there is. So I think, you know, my hope would be just that things are made as well as possible to last as long as possible. Yeah, I think it's um, just looking forward to this sort of dual future we have that we kind of talked about, this virtual side that I guess we're going to be going into more and more, but there is always going to be a physical side and there is this kind of marriage of the digital object but also that being realised with digital fabrication and that sort of dual existence we're going to have of fashion, I think, and I think that can be a really positive thing because it can solve maybe a lot of our problems that we are facing. So to me, that's kind of future and hopefully will be a positive future. Okay, th thanks so much for that. So be proactive, get started, think big, think about longevity, and it, I think we can all conclude that the future for fashion is definitely exciting. So I think all that remains for me to say is thank you for the invite. Thank you to Susie, Stephen and Laura for, for hosting us today and the Lighthouse staff and for, for the questions. You've made my job super easy being such an engaged audience with so much enthusiasm. So th thanks very much. A big hand for our panel.